It's good to see so many of you this Labor Day weekend. If we've not met, my name's Eric. I'm one of the members of the teaching team here at Journey, and we're excited that you're here. As you get rest from your labor this weekend, my message is hopefully going to have God put you to work for the kingdom. Are you guys okay with that? All right, we are continuing on in the book of Nehemiah today, but let me talk about the day and age in which we live in just a little bit before we go there. Have you ever noticed that life seems to have a way of trying to beat us down? Have you ever noticed that? Anybody? Am I the only one? Some of y'all can relate. You young people can't relate yet. Guess what? Life will have a way at times of trying to beat you down, trying to keep you discouraged, trying to keep you in a place of perpetually just barely making it. Can anybody relate to what I'm saying? All right, good. We're in the right place today. As I look at the state of our world, at times it could seem rather depressing. We see nation rising up against nation. We see our own country more divided than ever. You could pick any topic and put it out there on Facebook. It might not even be that benign, and then all of a sudden the sparks will begin to fly. No, that orange is not orange, it is blue. No, I'm telling you that it is orange, right? But all of a sudden people will fight over the color of an orange. We recently came out of a pandemic and uh, it seems that we have grim prospects of a recession with high inflation on the horizon. To add to it in our nation, we see people dying from addiction and disease. And those we look to at times in the faith often find themselves falling in sin and other things. Who do you look up to? Where does our hope come from? Sometimes these problems can actually seem insurmountable. How can an average, everyday, ordinary person like you or I make a difference in this kind of a context? I've even turned to Mary Jo at times and said, is it worth it to even try to make a difference? I'm here to tell you that it is. Can I get an amen for that? Even as I write this, or even as I was writing this, something began to echo in my soul. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season, if we do not give up, we will reap a harvest. Will you pray with me today? Father, we thank you. We praise you. We give you glory today. As we open up the book of Nehemiah, Lord, we're going to see an average, ordinary guy whose heart you ignited with a cause enter into his calling. But you're also going to see a group of broken people, a group of hurting people begin to find hope in you as you begin to build this wall, this hedge of protection for them, Lord Jesus. As you use them to be a part of the rebuilding of the wall so that people could return to Jerusalem and worship you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. As much as it's a story about them, it's a story about you and your goodness and your graciousness and your kindness and your love for your people. Would you continue to pour out your love in this generation? Can I get an amen? Amen, amen and amen. So why did I open up with all of that depressing stuff? Because if you open up the book of Nehemiah, as Pastor Adam shared just a couple of weeks ago, it's a time in the life of the Israelites that was not very good. It was a little bit like the day and age that we're living in. They were a people who were dispersed. They were a group of people who had fallen from God and began to look in different directions. They were a people who were beaten down and oppressed. The people who were their own countrymen were taking advantage of them by enslaving them with debt, right? It was a bad time for them, and it is in that context that Nehemiah rises up and comes onto the scene. But one of the things that I want you to see is that Nehemiah was generally an average, ordinary guy that had a very high-risk job. He had no staff. He had no group of, of people around him. In fact, as Adam shared, his job was to taste the food before the king ate it and make sure he didn't die. Come on, how many of you want that job? Y'all ready to sign up right now? He had to make sure there was no poison in the food or in the drink as the cupbearer. So um, while it was an important position, it was to be given to somebody that should be trusted, right? It wasn't some big job that he was a big man of influence and had all that. Remember, um, as it was shared in the past couple weeks, in fact, if you missed any of the messages, go online to Journey Church's website, download the church app. You could watch any of those messages. When it came time for him to actually share what was going on with the king, he came in fear and trembling, right? He didn't have the position 
to go be looking grim in front of the king on that particular day. He had to go there in all faith and confidence, believing that God would rescue him and that he would put something on the king's heart because guess what? The king could have just as easily killed him if God was not at work in the middle of that. So it wasn't a good time for the Jewish people. The city was broken down. The people were scattered and beating up, and it looked like they had no hope or no future. But we're about to hear a story of some incredibly good news about how God caused this one man to rise up and change the destiny of a people group. And I believe he wants to do the same with some of you who are here today. I believe he wants to use average, ordinary people like us. People who go to work and type on those computers, people who cut other people's hair, people who are teachers, people who are nurses, people who are at-home moms, people who are still in school. He wants to use you to make a difference in our country right now in the midst of all the pain and suffering that we see around us in our own city. Are you with me? Are you still tracking with me here today? I believe he wants to do the same thing in our generation. So let's dive in to the book of Nehemiah. Let's go back to the beginning for just a few moments and make sure we re-understand how it was set up. Nehemiah 1.1, the words of Nehemiah, son of Hakali. Now it happened in the month of Kislev that in the 20th year, I was in Susa the citadel that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with me with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the exile and concerning Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how deeply inquisitive he really was, or was it one of those conversations with your brother where you're just trying to start up some conversation and hear what's going on? I don't really know how it began, but all I do know is that what we're about to witness throughout this entire book is it started with a question. And one of the things that I want to help lay out today is I believe God wants to have some of you enter into your calling or take your calling to the next level. Maybe there's new ministries that are going to be birthed from this today. Maybe there's new businesses that are going to get birthed from this conversation today. And in Nehemiah, you see a little bit of a roadmap of how that came to be, how there was nothing that became something through a few steps. And in those steps, I think we can find great wisdom. So most everything in life starts with an idea, does it not? It starts with a question, a problem, a challenge. And that's what you see here. He's asking a question about his people. God's about to do something deep in his heart. And what he's about to hear was not good. Nehemiah 1.3, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard the words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. He hears the state of the people and God begins to put something on his heart. He doesn't know what to do about it at this particular moment. So what does he do? He begins to pray. So it starts with a question. It continues on with a prayer, right? God's putting something on his heart. He's feeling something for his people. For all I know, I don't read anywhere in the Bible if he's ever been to Jerusalem. But God's starting to put something on his heart for that city that he's never even been to. Potentially, right? Maybe he's been there. If not, God's certainly putting something on his heart. He hears about the condition of the people. I don't know about you, but when I was sharing some of those things in the beginning, is God putting something on your heart for the pain that's going on in our nation, in our city, and around the world right now? Maybe he is, and maybe you're like, Eric, I don't know what to do about it. What's a great first step? Pray. Lord, would you help me? Lord, would you guide me? I sense you starting to put something on my heart. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's a new ministry. Maybe it's a business. I don't know what it is just yet. But just as God put a heart for Nehemiah or heart in Nehemiah's heart for the people of Israel, for the city of Jerusalem, the place where God's presence dwells, I believe he wants to do the same thing in our generation. Pastor Adam challenged us the other week and he said, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. What would happen if you prayed that kind of prayer every day? How different would your life be? Most of us, we're afraid to pray that kind of prayer, right? Lord, I don't want to deal with it. You know, maybe that was even Nehemiah when he asked. I know I've asked those kinds of questions before. Like you ask somebody, hey, how you're doing? And you're praying they say fine. You're praying they say everything's okay. 
you really don't want to hear it if they say that things are jacked up, do you? You're like, oh my goodness, why did I ask that question? But then God started to really place something on his heart to do something about this challenge, to do something about the problem that they were experiencing in that particular moment. Lord, break our heart for what breaks yours. So I'll tell you, you could be mad at me if you'd like, but as I was preparing for this message, I prayed God would do just that in your hearts. I prayed that he would convict you. I prayed that he would put some people group upon you. I prayed that he would put some issue on your heart. I prayed that he would put some challenge before you. I prayed that he would put a stirring in you that you won't be able to get rid of until you do something about it. You see, I think most of the time our calling starts when God puts something like that on our heart and you can't get it out of your mind. You might try to. You might try to put it to the side. I'll share a story with you in just a little while about that, about how a woman did some incredible things, but she tried to put it off for a very long time until God really got a hold of her. And I believe God's going to do some things in your heart today in the very same way. He had a broken heart and a desire to make a difference. And guess what? When he started, that's all he had. His job was a cupbearer, right? He didn't have the resources to go change the city of Jerusalem. He didn't know anybody. He wasn't a leader at that time. He didn't probably even know how to lead. He was leading himself well, and that's about all that he was doing. So guess what? I share that with you today to say, you don't need anything to get started except for a heart because if your heart is in alignment with God's heart, guess what? The resources are going to show up on your behalf to make that dream become a reality. He's going to make it happen if you'll be obedient, if you will seek him. So he gives... Nehemiah, a great plan and a strategic model that we might follow and how we might help others, be it one-on-one, maybe even start a business or even change a city or a people. Let's reiterate it again for those of you who are note takers. I pray there's some note takers here in the room today. He starts with a problem. He starts with a question. So if you have a dream that God's beginning to put on your heart, start asking questions. What breaks your heart? What challenges are out there that you think God might have you fulfill to start a business? And then pray. It says, Nehemiah prayed. He fasted. He sought God. God was probably beginning to download a plan to him in those moments, but it was still a dream. The vision hadn't become a reality. Would you continue to dream? And two weeks from now, I'm going to talk to you about border bullies who are going to try to destroy your dreams and keep you from your calling and your destiny. But in him, you can overcome. All things are possible to him who believes in the king, Jesus. The next thing he does is an inspection or discovery, Nehemiah 2.11. So I went to Jerusalem and I was there for three days. Then I arose in the night. I and a few men with me, he had some counselors around him. And I told no one what my God had put on my heart to do for the city of Jerusalem. There was no animal with me, but the one in which I rode. I went out by night to the valley gate and to the dragon spring and to the dung gate. I bet he didn't hang out there long. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem and they were broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up by the night to the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back, and I entered the valley gate, and so I returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, or the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were there to do the work. So at this stage, he still keeps quiet. He feels it's too early. He doesn't tell anybody about it. He doesn't want to let the cat out of the bag until he begins to have a plan from God for what he's going to do, right? So he's going out there and he's checking things out. Just like you and I could check things out if God's putting some on your heart. Start the research. Where's the best place to start? Google, right? Go out there and start Googling some stuff. And then after you Google some stuff, go out there and start physically inspecting some stuff. Start to figure out what's going on and how God might make you to use a difference. Does he have a particular plan in mind for how he wants to go about things? Begin to ask others. He had some counselors alongside of them that were helping him get some wisdom from it. Am I making the right decisions? Am I really sensing God in the right way? Or am I going off the deep end in the wrong way, right? Have some good people around you that can give you some advice in the midst of that. So he examines that situation. 
In this case, there's a very tangible task that needs to be accomplished first. Before you could rebuild the people, you had to rebuild the wall. You had to have a hedge of protection around them. That was the first and foremost thing. And how do you rally a group of beat down people? Do you think that's the easiest task? How do we even get journey done with all you beat down people? Come on. Uh, Come on, I'm just teasing. Come on. You're allowed to laugh. You're allowed to have some fun up in here. He has a group of people that are beat down at that particular moment. They've been in distress. How do you rally that kind of people? We're about to see how he does it in just a couple of moments. So he asks some of the others probably. He gets wisdom from it. And then he starts to probably think through some scenarios. So here's what begins to happen. I'll, I'll give you some examples of what can happen. I think there's two or three things that can happen when God begins to put an idea on your heart and how you might execute on that idea, right? So in the early days of journey, um, some people began to ask us like, Eric, I really feel God putting it on my heart to start a food pantry here at Journey Church. And sometimes those are really good things. Maybe we're supposed to start a food pantry. We should never immediately reject something that's going on in the midst of somebody's heart. But it happened to be a subject that I had done some research on, that I had Googled. I was also thinking about what the need might have been. And in fact, at that particular time and season, we rarely ever got any requests for food benevolence. We rarely do even now, to be completely honest with you. It's a rare occasion that we get a food request right here at Journey, right? So it's like the requests are not that high. The government does have SNAP and other things that are doing it. In fact, um, I did research and there's four different organizations that are nearby that have fully functional food pantries that operate on different days throughout the week. Um, So what I had to think through at that particular moment was it's something that we should start or might there already be a ministry in existence that just needs a little help? So is God truly asking you to start something 100% new, or at times might he be asking you to join with something that already exists? So when I start to ask these fundamental questions, I would ask you to ask yourself that. Because a lot of times, um, maybe we just want to start something new, but the context ain't right. Why are you going to start a food pantry when nobody ever comes and asks you for food, right? But other places are there where people are going for food, so maybe God's calling you to move into that particular area and work with them. And in in that particular case, that was the decision, right? We said, hey, why don't we go partner up with some other food pantries and we could help support them and advance their ministries, and they're still going on today. Those needs are still being met. And Journey, 20 years later, still does not have a food pantry. (laughs) Doesn't mean we'll never have a food pantry, right? There could be a time and a season and a change where that would happen. But what I'm trying to drive at here is when you're starting a new business, when you're starting a new ministry, um, look for needs first. What is the need out there? Obviously, in Nehemiah's day, there was a compelling need in the city, right? And one of the first things he felt needed to be addressed was the building of the wall. In our context, in the same way, think about, is there a ministry that already exists that I might join with? Or is it something that God's truly creating me to want to do something new? And there are occasions that that, that's also true, right? So now say you feel like maybe it's time to move forward. There's a couple other confirmations that you might want to also get in the midst of that context. So, okay, I think I'm still at the stage where God's calling me to create a new ministry. I've looked out there and that particular ministry doesn't exist in the community. So what are some of the next things you might look for and what are the things that can happen? Um, God might close doors or God might open doors, right? So if you start that ministry and you begin to share it with other people and absolutely nobody's coming around you, then maybe God's not doing it at that particular time or season. It might not be final either, right? I'm just saying maybe he's saying, hey, hold on. You might still do it, but maybe now's not the time. Maybe you need to do some more work refining your project and your plan and the things that you're thinking through to make sure that other people can understand your vision and come alongside of you to be a part of it. And then guess what? Maybe you do it, and then all of a sudden, people start to hear that mission, that vision, and they're like, yes, that needs there. And guess what? God's putting it on my heart too. And then all of a sudden, he sends one or two or three other people, right? And then guess what? Something magical, maybe not the best word, something miraculous begins to happen where God starts to bring the resources alongside of you. I could think back to the early days of Journey, and that's kind of exactly what happened. We uh, were in Miami. I'm not from Jacksonville. I heard about it when we were in Miami. You know what the story and the theme of was Jacksonville? It was the stinky city that used to drive through to get to North Carolina. That was about all that we thought when we came here. 
So we, because they had all the paper mills back then, if you know that. The paper mills would be kind of stinky. Do you need, none of y'all are old enough to remember that. Come on, Jesus, right? So God ends up planting us here. And then we're here for a couple of years. And the church that we're a part of sadly ended up falling apart. It, it no longer existed. And we're like, man, there's still a need for this contemporary style church that we're, we're believing for. Um, you know, God, is this something? Like it was the furthest thing from my mind, to be completely honest with you. I had no desire to be a pastor But for some reason, God was putting this supernatural thing on my heart, like where we really started to care for all these hurting people in Orange Park and the surrounding areas. We're like, man, why, why God, are you causing us to fall in love with this city? We like Miami. We're from Miami. Can we please go back to Miami? No, this is where I've called you. This is the place where, where my spirit dwells for you, where I want you to do something. So we moved here and didn't even understand why God was moving us here, right? So then we start to pray about it. We start to think about it. We start to examine stuff. I probably visited 122 churches in Clay County. There were only 100 of them, right? But I went out there and we checked out all of them. And we're like, okay, God, are you calling us to maybe plug in here? Is this the place that you want to use us? Um, Okay, maybe not. There's some things that we might do different. And we went from place to place to place to place. And we really didn't feel home. We still felt for some reason that God was calling us to start a new work, right? Right? So then we said, okay, let's start to think about it and plan about it. And we brought a couple friends in and we said, I know this sounds crazy. I'm not a pastor. We, don't, we, we can hire a pastor when we get some money. We'll all put money together and we'll hire a pastor. That was actually the way we were thinking in those early days. And we said, what if we just opened up our house and see if people show up, right? So in our little house there in, in uh, Brookstone at Eagle Harbor, um, we ended up having like 50-something people showing up. I'm like, what in the heck is going on? You know, there was a church across the street. It's called something different now, but at the time it was Island View Baptist. And, you know, we had the boldness because all these people were showing up and they were like in our garage with their kids. And we walked across the street and we said, hey, we have this small group meeting on that wants to become a church. Would you let us use your your kids' church uh, nurseries on Saturday night? And they're like, "Um, okay, we'll let you do it. Like, okay, open door. Come on, Jesus, right? They let us do it. So then we would walk the kids across the street and we would take them over there. And then we started to pray about and we're thinking about, Lord, is this really something you want to do? 50 people can't keep coming to my house. This is not going to work. It's not going to work, right? So we went out and we found this little building on Kingsley that was 10,000 square feet that was ugly as all get out. I mean, it was ugly, ugly. I said, I don't want that building. Lord Jesus, would you help me? This, this thing's ugly. But guess what? We spoke to the owner, very miraculous fashion, all the details I don't have time to go in today, but they ended up giving it to us for $300 a month, and it was a 10,000 square foot building. So, oh, remember in Nehemiah, we just read about where he went up and he talked to the king, and all of a sudden the king started giving him wood, and he started to give him all these other things. So guess what? These confirmations, these miracles began to happen. So he said, okay, we're moving out of our house. We're going to go move over there on Kingsley, $300 a month. This is absolutely incredible. Where are people going to sit? Okay, guys, you can go out and you can go get your lawn chairs and bring them into church. We're going to have church with lawn chairs in there. And then before we even knew it, some church called us up and said, hey, we got a whole bunch of chairs we need to get rid of. Would you guys want them? We're like, yep, we'll take them, right? (laughs) So we went and we got these chairs and and they had to put in work. I was still working at the time and Mary Jo uh, was was at home and she had another friend named Claire. I remember Claire. They gave us these chairs. The chairs weighed like 250 pounds. There's these two little old ladies going in there throwing these chairs in the back of the thing sweating, you know, with a, they got a workout with it when they went and did it. But man, they were chairs. We were so happy to have chairs, right? And then we had worship by boom box. Y'all ready to come back? Come on, Jesus. We just set the, we don't even have boom boxes anymore, right? But we had worship by boom box. We put the boom box up there and then they came out with these things. They are God awful now if you look at them. They were called I worship videos and you would put the I worship video on and it had moving backgrounds and it seemingly looked really cool, but it wasn't very cool. And I'm like, why do these people keep coming back? What is wrong, Lord? Why? Why do people keep coming back? And then all of a sudden we get a call out of this uh, band from Orlando that was a Christian worship team. And they're like, hey, we heard you guys are starting up a new church. We'd be willing to come every Sunday for a couple months to help you get off the ground. We're like, you're signed up. I didn't even know if they were good or they were bad. We're like, come on over. You can come on over. You can lead worship. Come on. We got real live worship. We put the boom box in the back and it's been gone ever since. Come on, Jesus, right? <laughs> so what I'm saying is once you start to move into it, we didn't have no resources, We didn't have no building to meet. We didn't have a worship team. We didn't have any of those things, right? 
We were just trying to be obedient to what God had put on our heart. We had a bit of a plan. We had some ideas of what we thought God wanted to do. And what you'll find is that if it's what you're really called to do, God's going to begin to line those resources up, be it people, be it money, be it the right tools that you need. Uh, you know, and the, we needed to build out the place. Like it was not a church. It was an empty building. We had volunteers that were coming in. Um, David Montgomery, who we all love, who, who's gone on to be with the Lord now. David shows up and he's like, I'll redo the bathroom. I'll go tile the whole thing for you. So David goes in there and like retiles the whole bathroom. You wouldn't have wanted to go to the bathroom in there before David got in there. Come on, Jesus, right? And they made it a beautiful place where we could worship. And guess what? People are still worshiping in that same building 20 years later. To God be the glory, right? To God be the glory. He will bring you everything you need if you will start with that prayer. If you will start with that question. If you will humbly begin to seek him, he will bring everything you need to make that vision come to pass. There's a couple other things that could happen. You could get some opposition, and if you're doing anything for God, guess what? You will get some opposition, right? Nehemiah did. We're going to talk about that two weeks from now. Um, maybe nobody comes alongside of you as I share. That could be God closing a door. It could be saying not right yet. doesn't mean it's done. Um, but also, there's going to be some of the people that you think are closest to you that will come alongside of you that don't, and others that you never knew that will come alongside of you, and they'll be there to help you, right? So an old friend of mine had this saying, he said, some will, some won't, so what? Come on, Jesus, keep moving forward. Let me read on Nehemiah 2.17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we will no longer suffer derision. And I told them how my hand of God had been upon me for good and how the words of the king had spoken to me. And they said, let's rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. So he shared the vision. He shared what God was doing. People began to respond. They said, hey, we're going to do this. Let's get alongside of you. Let's do this for the glory of God. And then they executed Nehemiah 3.1. Then Elishab, the high priest, rose up with the brothers of the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakor, the son of Emery, built. And if you go on throughout chapter 3, it's one clan and one group of people after another group of people after another group of people that come alongside to rebuild that wall in miraculous fashion that God would be glorified, that his people would be safe, that people would begin to get healed, that people would begin to get delivered, that people would begin to set free, that addiction would flee, that all the things that we got going on in our country right now and in our city could be changed and transformed. If we, the people of God, would rise up, ask God, cry out, say, Lord, would you help me? Lord, would you give me a God idea? Lord, I want to go out there and make a difference. Lord, would you use me? It's not a time to sit back. It's not a time to sit in our seats. It's not a time to just say we're going to do something and don't step up and do something about it. We live in a day and age where it's the time to go out there and do the works of God and watch what he will do. For some of you, that'll be right here in our own backyard. In fact, for most of you, it'll probably be right here in our own backyard. Two blocks from here, there's more addicts and homeless people walking around than any other area in our region. They had to shut down the Orange Park Mall last night because people were basically rioting out in front, rioting in the AMC. We are people who are two blocks away from that, who have an opportunity that God might put on some of your hearts to go out there and work with some of those youth, to go challenge them, to love on them, to be there for them, to care for them. That instead of going out and creating a riot on a, on a Saturday night, they're going out creating a riot in righteousness for Jesus on a Saturday night. If some of you will step out, if you'll just say, Lord, would you use me? I see this problem. I see this challenge. You know, people did that with addiction here at CR. And you know how many people have been delivered because of that over the years? Because they stepped out in faith and said, hey, we're going to help one addict help another addict and whatever it might be so that they could get help. Where's your challenge? Where's your test? Where's your problem? What, have God, what has God brought you through? What a great starting point for that. Maybe you've been through a terrible divorce and it was hurt and it was pain and it was awful. Guess what? Maybe God might use all that awfulness and turn it around for good as you minister to other people who are going through the exact same thing, right? Maybe some bad stuff happened to you 
what if you turned it around for God's glory and for the good of others as you began to go out and minister in that exact area where the devil tried to take you out? Now you use it as an opportunity to bring people along and bring them into the kingdom of God and watch what God will do. I want to share with you a story of a lady named Maget Wade. She was born in Africa, and her country that she lived in is one of the poorest on the planet. She would see her countrymen in pain. She sees her whole continent at a place where it seems like the people of Africa can never get on top of it. What is the problem? What is the issues that underlie that? Why can't my people ever get out of the situation that they find themselves in? And her and her family had a chance first to move to France and then ultimately to America. And she ends up starting to rise to success. She lives in, um, in, in the uh, suburbs of Silicon Valley and she helps with a startup and makes millions of dollars in helping with that startup. Um, as part of that, she created a skincare company that ended up being an international skincare co uh, company sold in places like Whole Foods. And she's like, man, God, I have everything. And, and the story that you're about to see on this particular day, she says she's driving in a convertible car on that beautiful street there in California, like our version of A1A. I think it's, I don't know what it is, but it, have you all seen it like right there on the water? What's it called? Okay. Pacific Coast Highway. She's driving there. She's like best day of her life. But leading into that, there were these moments along the way where she would hear stories of her countrymen and be like, God, what happened? And she says in the video that she would stuff those feelings down. And then there was a story that broke of a young man, you might remember it from a few years ago, that tried to escape Africa to get to Europe by putting himself inside of the wheel well of a plane, right? And, th and then he ended up freezing to death in transit over there to, to Europe. And others, to put it very bluntly in her words, not mine, she had heard stories of other people that had done the same and ended up falling from the plane into the ocean to become fish food. And she's like, how in the world are my people becoming fish food to try to get out of the circumstances that they find themselves in? Yet for years, she attempted to run from God and run from this gnawing sensation that God was putting on her heart. In the video you're going to see, uh, Jordan Peterson is interviewing her. And I got about a two and a half minute little clip I'd like to share with you. Why do you why do you think your conscience bothered you at that point? I mean, you had been yeah, you had been you'd come to the states, you'd yeah. you'd become successful, you had this beautiful day. And so why all of a sudden do you suppose your thoughts turned to the people that had been left behind, so to speak? I mean, it wasn't your fault that they were in the state they were I in. I know. Yeah. I know it wasn't my fault for sure. It took me a long time to accept that it wasn't my fault. Uh, so what happened that day is I no longer was able to play the schizophrenia game that I played my whole life. I was no, able, no longer able to, the, the coping mechanism that I had developed up till then no longer was holding. Uh, the coping mechanism that I had developed back for all of these years was as soon as I started thinking about it, I would actually tell myself, this is not your fault, you, you have a life to live, it is not fair. Yeah, I, I would tell myself all of these stories and then I would just shrug it under the rug. Mm -hmm. Act as if it, but that day, for some bizarre reason, it just no longer worked, and I lost mm. it. I lost it. My body, it was, the, the feeling was so violent that my body jerked, literally, and it's a miracle that I'm talking to you because it, my, my body jerked so much that with it, the steering wheel, and I was going to end up down below in that ocean, but for some reason, it didn't, and as soon as I found a spot to stop, I stopped and I got out of the car. Something major had happened. I still don't explain what it was, but at mm. that time, Jordan, I surrendered. I surrendered. I said, God, from here on, I'm showing up. And I promise you, and I want you to help me make sure that every breath I take from here on is gonna go towards the bettering of my continent. Mm. Right? I just made that deal with God. I said, this is what I, I'm showing up for this, I present and I offer myself. This is why, did you think, why did you think this was between you and God, so to speak? Because it was so big. It was so big. And um, it, it, it was so big and he's the only one that I trusted to help me with that. The only one. 
And most importantly, I had no idea what to do about it. But mm -hmm. I knew that faith would be my best ally in this until I could figure it out. Yeah, well, faith, faith sometimes is the courage to do difficult things. He touched Nehemiah, and Nehemiah couldn't run from it any longer. I remember a story in the New Testament where Paul is going about his way persecuting Christians, and then he gets knocked off of his horse, so to speak. Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Oh, Lord, Lord. He becomes one of the greatest apostles of all time, right? He did it in people's life in a smaller way, like Mary Jo and I, right? He did it in her life, very similar way. She says she was about, she physical manifestation, she was about to drive herself off of the cliff, right? He's knocking her off of her Ford Mustang, her horse, to get her where he needed her to be, right? And then did you hear her prayer? Man, what a scary prayer. Lord, from this moment forward, would every waking breath of mine be to make a difference in the people of my continent? And I tell you, she's lived that way. She's leveraged the resources. If you go on to watch the rest of the video, she's leveraged the resources. She's created a university. She's done a ton of stuff for the betterment of her people in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. But I'm just crazy enough to believe that he wants to do the same thing through you. I fully believe it. I believe some of you have had dreams in your heart much like she had. You've been pushing them to the side. You're saying, Lord, not me. I can't do it. It's too big. There's no way. How would you use me? Well, I'm telling you, maybe he wants to use you. Others of you might be saying, well, Eric, I've had this dream in my heart but there's also a bunch of sin in my heart and it needs to go. Guess what? You're right. If you want to walk forward in that, you need to be holy. And I pray that this very day you'd be comfortable enough and know that you're in a comfortable enough place where nobody would judge you, that you would say, yeah, that's me. I need, I need help. Lord, would you change me? Would you transform me? I want to live for you from this day forward for the rest of my life. Would you help me overcome this stronghold in my life? Maybe it's a ministry. Maybe it's a business. Maybe it's stepping up and plugging into journey. Maybe it's starting out in faith with a small group. But is God laying something or someone or some people group on your heart right now? I certainly pray that he is. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes today? I fully believe that God wants to use you to make a difference in the lives of others, in Jesus' name. So are you here today and maybe...